Could a Texas Longhorn quarterback be under center for the Bears next year? Mm -mm. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Locked on Baylor brought to you by Game Time. And thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. We so appreciate that. Huge quarterback news. All of a sudden, the last few days for the Baylor Bears, of course, we talked about Daquan Finn, the Toledo legend, before. Uh, we talked about him yesterday. <laughs> he was on campus yesterday. Actually, uh, Thursday is the is the report that we heard um, was that he was in here visiting the facilities yesterday, and I talked about how big how big a recruiting win that would be for Baylor. Look, I, I, he's not going to have his number retired or anything like that, but in a year where so much goes wrong and it looks like the state of the program is just absolutely going down the crapper. And to be able to bring in one of the best quarterbacks in the portal would be a huge win for Baylor. And I think would be, again, like I said yesterday, one of the only guys in the portal at any position who can come in and add some wins to your schedule. No one can do that like a quarterback can. And he is one of the most accomplished quarterbacks and one of the most skilled quarterbacks that's in the transfer portal. And then we heard also yesterday, like literally as Daquan Finn's on campus, a report from Pete Thamel, who is one of the the leading writers in college football, one that you should definitely uh, trust, uh, has this report. He goes on College Football Live, and he's talking about Malik Murphy, who officially entered the transfer portal, I believe it was Wednesday, the, the Texas backup quarterback who did see some time when Quinn Ewers was hurt this year, got a, got a couple of starts on under his belt. And he's talking about the, the teams that Malik Murphy – would, would be interested in, or teams that would be interested in him, I should say. He says, quote, preliminary, preliminary list. It's very early still. A couple of schools that have indicated interest are both USC's, that's Southern Cal and South Carolina, Georgia, Oregon State, Syracuse, Duke, and Baylor. What? Seriously? Baylor? Malik Murphy? I'm sure most of you guys were saying, sign me up. And look, if that's if that's what Baylor can do, I'm like, okay, I'll 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 take that. Now I don't know how many recruiting battles, just it, with all things being equal, they're winning with those schools, but this is the transfer portal. Not all things are equal. You know, not not all teams are gonna put him as their number one priority. Um, not teams are not all teams. Not all these teams, I should say, are gonna have the same NIL that they can give out. You think Baylor's bad? Syracuse doesn't even use it. You think Duke's is much better? I don't know. These are basically what doubles. He, Pete Thamel goes on to say this. Those are basically what doubles as a list of quarterback needy schools. And there's plenty of interest for Malik Murphy. That part of the quote, I think, well, <laughs> are these teams actually showing interest in Malik Murphy? Or are these just teams that Pete Thamel thinks needs quarterbacks? They do, by the way. But does he know Daquan Finn is, is in visiting at Baylor the very day that he says this, probably the very moment he says this? I don't know. So that makes me think, is this a team that, or a list of teams that Pete Thamel has known that has real interest in Malik Murphy, or are they just teams that need a quarterback? So take it with a grain of salt, I think, uh, when it comes to that report. I, I don't know. I, I don't have many sources inside the building. I, I've checked it and kicked the tires on a few. Uh, no one's really heard much about Malik Murphy. So there's nothing I can stand on it and say about that. Um, now, what I will say about Malik Murphy is he's a heck of a player, at least in terms of his potential. Uh, we haven't seen him on the field all that much, but he was the number nine quarterback recruit in 2022, which made him comfortably the lowest ranked of the three quarterbacks that, that played for Texas this year. Number one in Quinn Ewers in, in, uh, in 2021 and then number one in Arch Manning in, in 2023. So uh, he was comfortably behind, but the number nine quarterback in his class, by the way, love where he went to high school, Junipero Serra High School. You might know it as the alma mater of Barry Bonds. He'll be the greatest baseball player ever. Oh, but Cam, we're talking about football here. Okay, it's also Tom Brady's alma mater. 
So probably the best baseball player ever and unequivocally the best football player ever also produced Malik Murphy. Uh, so he, he gets some action in six games this year. A couple of Longhorn blowouts, as you can imagine, but did start two in, in the middle of the year and actually a couple of big games, big home games for the Longhorns when Quinn Ewers was hurt. And in, in his six games, he goes 40 for 71, which is only about a 56% completion percentage. Not not terrific, not jumping off the page. Throws for 477, three touchdowns, three picks. They go 2-0 and in his starts. Remember the, the thriller against Kansas State in overtime? And and then uh, beat BYU pretty handily. I think that was thirty five to six. So, so, I mean, the the numbers aren't terrific, but he's also this is his first time really playing, and it's just not easy for a kid when when Quinn Ewers is the guy and has been for two years now to come in in the middle of a a Big Twelve championship season, a a playoff season, and keep the status quo. And, and to ha- score a big win, by the way, against Kansas State, who was who was hot on their heels for for a Big Twelve championship game appearance, Malik Murphy comes in and and he gets the job done. Now, looking at some of his splits, uh, it just shows me he's a he's a young guy. Uh, but but the the long way of saying that his best completion percentage and yards per attempt were in the first quarter, and the worst of those two stats were in the fourth quarter. Uh, so what that says to me is, look, he plays for an excellent offensive coach and Steve Sarkeesian, right, was one of the very best in the nation. So he gets a good game plan. And on the scripted drives, he did really well and showed a lot of confidence in that. And maybe that confidence or that execution kind of waned as the game went on. But for a kid who's 19 years old and he's getting his first starts this year, I, that that's still... That still speaks volumes to me. I mean, that's that's still pretty good. And and what people really love about him is that potential that they see in him. Um, the spring game, he stole the show for UT. And Arch Manning's first time in a Texas uniform, it was Malik Murphy that stole the show. He had these back-to-back, just 40-yard bombs, like on a, <laughs> on a sixpence, 40 yards down the field. One of them's dropped. One of them goes for an 80-yard touchdown. So he was the one that stole the show in Arch Manning's uh, Texas debut, if you will, in the spring game. And and again, that number nine quarterback in the class, he's 6'5", 238, and got a cannon for an arm. You know, we're, we're still waiting to see that completion percentage go up and that accuracy go up, but that's a 19-year-old kid playing major college football for the first time. Uh, the intangibles are, are really good. I mean, he... If nothing else, he will be a combine star at the worst. I mean, it's not unreasonable to compare him to someone size-wise as as Jalen Hurts. That's a lot like what Jalen Hurts looked like when he started at Alabama. And I think Malik Murphy can throw the ball a little bit better than Jalen Hurts can. Don't know if that means he's going to take a team to a Super Bowl in a couple of years, but that's a pretty darn good comparison. That's That's a national championship quarterback and a guy who was... Uh, the the Heisman Trophy winner through about six or eight weeks in Joe Burrow's season when he was incredible. Jalen Hurts was right at the top of that. So um, that that's kind of the intangibles of him. I I watched him in those two games because I watched a lot of UT this year. Uh, something I I did notice about him was even though the accuracy wasn't tip top, he he really wasn't too jittery. Like he has a smooth game, and if Baylor can come in and get a guy like that. That's, I'll take that 10 times out of 10. Now, here's what Malik had to say about it uh, on when asked uh, what he's looking for in a transfer destination. Quote, a place where I can play, end quote, or continue to get better and continue to be around great people and great players and just to do what's best for me in my career. But a place where I can play is what he's looking for. Baylor is that. Absolutely, Baylor is that. I've said it a few times now. I think if you bring in someone the quality of a Malik Murphy or a Daquan Finn, that's an open competition. As much as I do like the potential of Sawyer Robertson, I do. This is a place where he can come in and play right now. Now, he is from Inglewood uh, before going to Junipero Serra, which is up in 
the Redland San Mateo up there by San Francisco, but he's originally from Inglewood, which is in LA. So USC comes calling. That's a, that's a tough one for him to put down. Uh, Oregon state just lost their top two quarterbacks. So they're, they're pretty desperate. Um, he could be playing a pac 12 <laughs> schedule. I don't know what Oregon state's going to be playing next year. And obviously George is a really, really tough one to turn down. Uh, up there's one of the big powers of the sec and he can actually take on UT while he's there. So Baylor, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're showing real interest or if Pete Thamel just says, well, Baylor needs a quarterback, but let me know what you think. I I'd take Malik Murphy. I'd probably take Taquan Finn first because of his experience and what I've seen him do on tape and what he has accomplished uh, versus the potential of a Malik Murphy. But there's a reason why he's so hyped up and why he's going to be um, one of the, I mean, right now, one of the biggest, biggest names in the transfer portal. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. If you want to see Malik Murphy play next year, no matter where it is, and you don't want the hassle of the ticket buying experience, and what that is in, in 2023, you need to go with game time because this is like a throwback for buying tickets. It's it's, it's so much easier. Uh, I, I've mentioned it a few times, but going to the Bruins game last month in Dallas, I, I kind of waited till last minute because I knew game time would have me. I was literally on the way to the game, got the view of my seats before I purchased, didn't have any of the hidden fees. It was beautiful. It was a great ticket buying experience. They, they sent it right to my phone. So I can't, I can't speak enough to how good game time is for getting those tickets. You'll need them for the Foster Pavilion this year as well. Tickets are not going to be easy to come by for Baylor men's basketball or women's basketball for that matter. Game time is going to have you covered. They take the guesswork out of buying tickets. Okay, so what you need to do, you need to download the game time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Okay, let's do that again. Download the game time app, create an account, Use the code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. So download game download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. I talked a little bit about basketball with game time. Let, let's talk a little bit more basketball. Baylor men are finally back. By the way, congratulations to the ladies on a nice win yesterday. 99-37 over Delaware State, closing out the Farrell Center. We did a little bit of a half eulogy for the Farrell Center uh, in yesterday's show before the ladies played that game. But looking at the men's side of things, they're finally back. It's going to be their first game in, I think, 11 days when they take the court tomorrow in Detroit at Little Caesars Arena, home of the worst team in the NBA, the Detroit Pistons. And they're taking on maybe the most disappointing team in all of college basketball, the Michigan State Spartans. And boy, what a tailspin. Michigan State has been on the first month of the season. They started preseason number five in the nation or number four. They were in the top five. And it was actually on the way back from that Bruins game that Drake and I went to, the Bruins and the Stars, where they lost on opening night, Michigan State did, to James Madison. Opening night. It's it's not been a good season uh, for Tom Izzo's team. They are already 0-2 in the Big Ten and 4-5 and overall. And if you think, boy, that, that's that's pretty bad for a, a team that started in the top five. It is pretty bad. You're right about that because the 4-5 and five start, they just lost to Nebraska, by the way. Nebraska, who hasn't won a tournament game ever. That 4-5 and five record ties the worst, worst start by a preseason top five team in the last 40 years. Two other teams have done that. Uh, Louisville in 86-87, after they beat a great Duke team with Johnny Dawkins the year before in the title game. And then 2003-2004, Michigan State. So Tom Izzo has been there before, and he is maybe the best coach, active coach, in all of college basketball. You certainly have two of the top five squaring off against each other in terms of coaches on Saturday in Detroit. So it's been a while since he's been here, but he has been here and that doesn't excuse how bad this has been for Michigan state. I mean, it's just, it's just been terrible. Um, they rank 12th in the big 10 in scoring offense. Okay. Which is bad in and of itself. But then I tell you, this is a team that went to the sweet 16 last year and they returned 75% of its scoring and its minutes from a year ago. 
and they're this bad to start the season. So veteran laden team with, with success, both in the tournament and in the numbers and they stink. They stink. They're 69th in Ken Palm adjusted offensive efficiency, which is 42 spots lower than where they ended last season. 69th in quote unquote total adjusted offense. They are 73rd. For context, Baylor is second in the nation offensively. I mean, we know Baylor, this is a special team, but if you're ranked in the top five, which was 15 spots higher than Baylor in the preseason poll, you better be up there in terms of numbers. And they're nowhere close. Nowhere close, man. They do play good defense. They're 16th in adjusted defense, according to Ken Palm. Baylor, we've seen some pretty good defensive stretches this season. They are uh, 42nd, to give you a bit of an analysis there. But but they're terrible, man. I mean, uh, inside, outside, they're, they're really bad. They're 4-5, and five, and none of those are against a top 60 Ken Palm team. Um, multiple teams ranked, or multiple losses, obviously, to teams out, ranked outside that top 60. So just not good at all. Um, <laughs> one, one writer put it, the Spartans are average inside the arc, terrible outside of it, and are currently projected by Ken Palm to go 10-10 and 10 in the Big Ten, which is nowhere near the, the, the level of the Big 12, by the way. Um, so it puts their 26th straight tournament appearance in some serious, serious danger six weeks into the season. And we, we, we talked about that's a, that's a good benchmark that six weeks into the season. If you're in the top 12 for the last 20 years, teams in the top 12, or I should say of the last 20 years, <laughs> the national champion, each one of them was inside the top 12 in week six. Obviously Baylor's there. Michigan state is nowhere close. Um, they've needed to go small a lot. One guy to look out for is Malik Hall. Um, he's a six, eight guy who they've put at center sometimes this year to try and exploit matchups. Um, he's also a guy who can defend a couple different positions, obviously six, eight long, um, but was a good contributor for them last year. He played 25 minutes a game last year off the bench. Think about that. I mean, that's I. Ooh, that I mean, situationally, that's like Jonathan Chamachacho or Jeremy Sohan, who would come in for Flo Thamba, who is the starter in name only. But neither of those guys are playing twenty five minutes. This kid was playing twenty five minutes off the bench. He's he's starting this year, also playing twenty five minutes and averaging ten and five on forty seven percent shooting. So um, that that's pretty good. He's he's been one of the bright spots for them. But they think that. Sometimes that's going to exploit some mismatches, but Baylor's going to be able to do that on the other end because of the production they have in the paint. You know, a six eight guy, I don't care how old he is, by the way, he's a fifth year senior. He's gonna have trouble with Eve Meesey. Eve Meesey's a unicorn, man. He can he can he can do he's got all the moves already inside. And you put a six eight guy on him, again, I, I don't care if he's 23 and Eve Meesey's 18. Eve Meesey's gonna take him to the rack, man. He really is, and and Josh Ojanmuna can do it too. And what I've noticed about those two guys specifically, but Baylor as a whole, is you can't isolate those guys. Teams have tried it, especially against Misi, where they'll clear it out and try to isolate him and, and go one-on-one -on -one against him and, and feed their big guy in the paint. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Janai Broom of Auburn, who's one of the best big guys in, in the SEC, he couldn't even do it. I don't think Malik Clark's going to do it, although it sounds like he's a good player, good contributor, good leader on the team. He's not doing that. Not doing that against Steve Meese. Now, one thing Michigan State really does have going for them is they are very desperate for a win. And Tom Izzo, like I said, is one of the absolute best college basketball coaches still doing it. He's a Hall of Famer. Um, one national championship is probably less than he should have, but always had a ton of respect for, for him and his teams. They always peak at the right time. Um, they're going to need that a little bit earlier this year, or they're going to be in serious trouble of, of missing the tournament, even with the big 10 not being the strongest conference in America for sure. But this is, this is a good test for Michigan state to, to get a big quad one win, which they only have one of this season to, to knock off a top 10 team and Baylor who's got a, you know, has had a long layoff, has had finals, 
got to travel up to Detroit. That part kind of plays into Michigan State's hands. Everything in terms of the numbers and the basketball side of things does not, does not. So it's not going to be a great one for the RPI for Baylor in terms of what we thought it was going to be before the season when Michigan State was a top five team. But they could put a hurting on the Spartans and and really show show the nation that that they are that national championship caliber that we at Baylor definitely think that they are. I also got to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's my favorite way to win money. It's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. And with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball in the specials league. It's it's created specifically for these kind of projections that go across two different sports. So for example, you can do LeBron James and Travis Kelsey at 10 and a half, the combo of three pointers plus receptions. That's money in your pocket right there. And you can play alongside guys like Andrew Schultz, Meek Mill. They love to tell you what they're playing. You can find that in the community tab, or excuse me, the promos tab to join that prize picks community and see what they're picking in it. My favorite part about it, I always tell you it's my favorite part. It's true, especially when the when you get later in the season, it happens more often. Prize picks offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured in the the early parts of a game. So let's say it's the first quarter, first half, they go out, they don't return in the second half. That player gets rebooted. And prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform that has that injury insurance policy. So what you got to do, man, you got to go to prizepickscom slash locked on college and use the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepickscom slash locked on college. And then you're using the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Hundred dollars prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. And for me, looking at kind of the biggest difference between these two teams, if I'm going to sing single out players here, um, so the biggest difference in terms of personnel between Baylor and Michigan State are two five star freshmen that I'm going to highlight, and it's going to show maybe why. Michigan State hasn't lived up to any kind of expectation yet. And it will also show just how good we've got it here at Baylor right now. Okay. I'm looking at Xavier Booker and I'm looking at Jacoby Walter, two five star freshmen, some of the top guys in their class, the ones who are going to come in and make the instant impact with their teams that are both vying for national championships, national championship aspirations. Well, one has done that and one has not done that yet. Okay. Xavier Booker, 10 minutes a game, shooting 30% from the floor, 23% from three, and averaging about three points a game. That's just that's just not going to get it done. Um, now, I will say this kid's 18, 19 years old. Uh, I don't care how much hype you've got going into your freshman season. You're still a freshman. And he is just not adjusted very well to the college game at all. It seems like it's too fast for him. Um, early in the season, of course, but that's something where Michigan State put a lot on this guy, or at least the people from the outside, I should say, put a lot of expectations on this kid and therefore Michigan State. And when he doesn't live up to it, that's that. That's why they're in free fall. That's why they started this preseason number five and they don't have a number next to their name anymore. Versus you look at Jacoby Walter, who comes in with what I would have said even before the season was a better supporting cast but he comes in, he's playing 27 minutes a game. That's a huge, I'm almost tripling how much Michigan State can play Xavier Booker. 27 minutes a game, 42% from the field, 38% from three, and 15 points a game and about five rebounds and a couple of assists per game. That is just so good. That is a special talent, man. It really is. And it, you see it year after year. I mean, I'll, I'll look back to two years ago. Kendall Brown is the one that comes in as the big, the four-star recruit. McDonald's All-American, all that. And he doesn't really get off the ground at Baylor. Whereas the other guy you brought in, Jeremy Sohan, becomes a top 10 pick in the draft that very year. So it, it it's not always so easy to tell whether these guys are going to be studs or not. You know, 
Ask, ask the teams that recruit four or five of them a year. Ask Duke. Ask Kentucky. Baylor and Scott Drew specifically have done so well with these freshmen. Eve Meese, been a revelation this year as a kid who graduated early to come here. I didn't think we were going to see much of him at all. Just, just because I thought he was going to be raw and he was going to be young. He's been a stud. Jacoby Walter, I'm like, well, you know, if he's as good as Keontae George, that'll be a nice plus. He's been better than Keontae George was so far. And that's no knock to Keontae. That's just more credit to Jacoby Walter, man. He's been that good. And 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 you look at how easily it can fall apart in the early part of the season with someone like Xavier Booker. I hope he turns it around, man. I really hope so. But he plays about a third of the amount of minutes as Jacoby Walter, and he commits the same number of fouls. I know it's a weird thing to focus in on, but to me, that shows that one of them was more ready for the speed of the college game. One of them gets more trust from his coach to play him almost the entire game. The other has trouble so far keeping up with it. It doesn't have the confidence of his coach to play more than 10 minutes a game. I think that's the big difference in the personnel, at least. I think Baylor is a deeper team. They are a better team. And I just hope that this layoff and this travel does not become a hurdle for them. Because in theory, Baylor should throttle Michigan State tomorrow. They really should. And I think the Spartans will turn it around to a degree. I think they'll be in the rankings again at some point. I think they'll go on a nice tear in the Big Ten because I believe in Tom Izzo that much. And that's going to make the win look a lot better. But you talk about the disappointments going into this season of top 10, top five teams. Baylor's got the next two right on the schedule, Michigan State and Duke. <laughs> and I know Scott Drew has been prepping for both of those teams over the last week and a half here. So I am so excited to see them get back out on the court. That's 1 p.m. tomorrow. Um, we'll, we'll try to get a post game in for that live post game, no matter how it goes. But I, I honestly, I think Baylor's going to win pretty comfortably. I think they're going to win by 14, 15 points. And that's my sincere hope. What do you think? Let me know what you think down in the comments. Score predictions, how the season's going to go, why Michigan State's in the tailspin. Would you have Malik Murphy here for the Bears? Would you take him over Daquan Finn? Be interested to see what you guys have to say about that. I'm rolling with Daquan. I, I would really be so happy with either one. And if I'm even stuck, just quote unquote stuck with Sawyer Robertson, I'm feeling okay about that too. I really am. So uh, let me know what you think down in the comments. Thank you for making this your first listen today and every day. This is the only place that you're getting nothing but Baylor Athletics content every day, not coming from the university. And we're proud of that. Be sure to like and subscribe. Leave a comment. We'll be back post game tomorrow. Baylor, Michigan State here on Locked on Baylor.